today after being stabbed allegedly by his stepfather. Police say the boy's mother and his younger sister died in the attack. Both were stabbed to death last night at their home in Morning Springs Trail in Oak Cliff. That's where CBS 11's Arzo Dost is live tonight with details on the investigation. Arzo. And Doug, Dallas police tell us Gary Green was waiting here at this house for his wife. She'd recently filed for divorce. Police say as soon as she walked into this house, she was attacked. And then so were her kids. Yellow police tape surrounds Lavetta Armstead's one-story brick home. On this day, her distraught sister comes by the house, hoping there was a mistake. Wait a minute, what happened? I just got a phone call. The DISD substitute teacher had just gone home Monday night with her six-year-old daughter, Jasmine Montgomery. She had dropped off her two sons at church. Here at home, police say Gary Green stabbed her and then turned on his stepdaughter. She was a very kind lady and she did not deserve what happened. Green then went to church to pick up his nine and 12-year-old stepsons. Back at the house, he stabbed the younger boy in the stomach. His older brother was not hurt. Uh, the two boys were able to, uh, uh, we believe, talk uh, Mr. Green out of killing them. The children were not Greens biologically. Neighbors say he was a devoted father. But you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell if they were or were not. You know, he was like a dad to them. He'd have them outside and the little girl would ride her bicycle and, you know, he'd be out with them. Now, after Green left this house, police say he tried to kill himself by overdosing on prescription medication. He then called his mother. She's the one who convinced him to turn himself in. He is charged with capital murder. And Dallas Arzo Dost, CBS 11 News. That's a big guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So, um, introductions, of course. Now, I've got to get my mom saying that I carefully and lovingly create in between seasons she says saying i say joke mother joke anyway my name is sherry i'm this mom is outline of a murder mm -hmm. and mom knows that there are more plastic flamingos in america than real ones that's a, that's a really wrong one to say no are you not. saying i'm old no i'm saying that you're knowledgeable about flamingos yes thank you sherry I had no idea that there were more plastic Is that flamingos. True? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's more plastic than real ones? You're breaking up my whole perso persona I'm that sorry. I just created for you. I just said you know that. Yeah, I did know that. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I did consider getting some. I'm going to tell you the truth. This summer, I was going to get some put in the backyard. <laughs> anyway, this case will be one of the most disturbing. <laughs> and I want to warn anyone with kids that you probably do not want them in the room. And it is the case of Lavetta Armstead, which is a, a local case for you, uh, a 32-year-old mother of three. So the news person looked familiar. Did the case look familiar? Did you remember no. that? Mm -mm. Okay. Children, though, are the worst. Yeah, and that's they're why it's bad. just me and you. Yeah, they're um, all bad, but children are just for some so it can be innocent. really hard to do cases on you know kiddos yeah. and um, so this right here is Lavet Lavita Lavetta I'm sorry with Jerome Jarrett and Jasmine and she was a teacher and had been raising her children as a single mom before she met Gary Green. Um, here's a picture of her with little Jasmine, her Aww. only daughter. And let me see. And so here cute. is a picture of her and Green. When they met? I don't know if that's when they met or if they were already living I'm just together. Saying, he looks angry. Doesn't he? Yeah. I was going to ask he you if he you looks noted, angry. noticed anything on his picture because to me, he looks like an angry yeah. man. Look at his mouth. Yeah. Tight. Yep. Eyes. Yep. And look at her smiling. Yeah, she um, was a really, really um, positive, happy person. And he, though, was a convicted felon. Oh. He had a violent history, especially against women. And he also had a history of some mental health issues. But 
all of that was hidden under his um, outward charm. So she didn't know any of that? No, she had no idea. Mm -mm. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so um, Lavetta was like a woman that everybody said radiated positivity. And Jerome uh, said that his mother always inspired him to follow his dreams and goals, which leads me to the first tip, I guess you could say, is don't allow being positive, kind, and a loving Mm -hmm. person to blind you to the evil that you might be around, that might be lurking in other people. You know, I've heard um, people I know at work mm-hmm. that know somebody that knows somebody that there's there's um, things you can do now to look people up. Yes. Especially if you're doing dating at, or really anything. Yeah. You can look them up now and see and a see little if bit there's of any background. background and stuff. Sometimes I think that's dangerous too. On the other side, if you're stalked or abused, you're yeah. trying to hide. You know, people it's can good find and bad. You. Yeah. yeah, it is. I don't think that any if anyone has, you know, like someone that's stalking them, I don't right. think their information should be anywhere on I agree. the Internet at all. Like there should be like a block or something that they can put up to protect them. I agree. Now, um, Lavetta, she was a very positive person and well liked, but she was also a strong woman. And she handled her business if needed. And, you know, you had to be that if you had three uh, kiddos. You do. You know, so let's see. There's a picture of her with them. And then I thought I had another one. I guess I don't of her with her little kiddos. But they, they're just so cute. And uh, this is a house that they lived in. It's a nice house for mm-hmm. a single mother. Yeah. Yeah. She um, did good for herself. Provide for well her. for her children. I'm not sure where uh, Lavetta and... Uh, green met they might have and, and i'm also not sure if they were married um at the time that that photo right there was taken where he looks angry um but they i believe dated one to two years prior before they got married in 2009 um but again i couldn't find exact dates see so you can meet somebody get married in a week meet someone Get One married two in two years. years. I mean, you don't know. And it wasn't long after their marriage that things started going down south. Uh, in fact, um, the court used three letters to prove premeditation and motive. One of the letters was written by Lavetta and verified by people who knew her uh, on notebook paper where she asked Green to move out of their home. And she also wrote, I know you love me and I love you, but it's time we part. And then in another letter, she voiced regret at allowing him back into her life. And then in a final letter written by Green, he told her that he planned on killing her, the children, and himself. Oh, and in the he, letter? Yep. And he wrote, you asked to see the monster, so here is the monster you made me. Oh, you made me. Right. Yeah. So okay. typical deflection. Yeah. Typical, it's her fault. You know, I wonder in the two years that they dated, if she saw, does it say anything about her seeing any flags anything no i couldn't find anything on that but i do know that after they got together there was definitely some red flags and also like that one neighbor lady said that he was like a dad to those kids you wouldn't have known that he's different from the minute he moved in he was controlling and dominating and abusive to those kids wow Mm -hmm. and i think she saw it um, but yeah, I wanted to, you know, put that in there. The monster you've made me, the guy was a monster way before. Mm-hmm. In fact, I saw him in an interview. I don't know if it was signs of a psychopath or mind of a killer where this lady would go and interview capital punished, you know, uh, criminals. And he was one of them and he just blamed her and he's not a monster and he's not this and blah, blah. But he has a history of being all of those things. Most abusers, though, they do blame the spouse, the girlfriend, everyone else, your friends, your mom. And they weren't married uh, too long at this point either because she wanted it annulled. Oh. And I think there's like a time limit, isn't there? I think so. When you can annul. Yeah. And so, like most probably abusers, he had a really good con, you know, artist thing going on. He was advertising that he was a great husband, but he was actually evil. And uh, and unfortunately, she didn't find out until it was too late. The little things you said about his mother, though, I mean, it sounded like 
she was a good mother. I mean, oh, normal mother. Oh, she was mother a great mother. In fact, to him. from the overall story, it seemed like what she was doing is she wanted to get her kids away from him. Wow. Yeah, so she definitely. But she was there long enough or with him long enough where the kids saw some things, which I'll, I'll get into. No, I meant his mother. Oh, I don't. Tell him to follow his dreams. Was there any kind of abuse in his life? Do you know? That wasn't Gary Green. That was her kid. Oh, yeah. her kid. Yeah, her oh, kid. Follow her dreams. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. I, yeah. thought I misunderstood. Now, he also wrote in the letter that there will be five lives taken today, me being the fifth. And so I wanted to point out, you know, like, again, you made me this way is a deflection. It's a lack of responsibility. Um, I mean, in other words, it's kind of like, well, I wouldn't hit you if you wouldn't make me so angry. Right. You know, you hear mm-hmm. that stuff. And uh, he finished off the final letter with this, which would really make Elena mad because she hates that. You know, that God bless thing oh, when you're such I a poop bird. Right. I pray that the Lord allows my soul to burn in heaven. If not, I will burn in hell forever. Now, that's pretty stupid, actually. Yeah, it is. So you're going to go murder an entire family, but you're hoping that after you get done and you kill yourself, that maybe God will let you in heaven. If not, it's okay. I'll just burn in hell anyway. So why even write that? That is the dumbest thing. Wonder if it was for a little sympathy. I I think so. And I um she was a Christian woman and her little boys were at Bible study that night. They were at church. And so I think that it was just one of those manipulative tactics. So he wrote it and said, Today Mm -hmm. five people are gonna die. Yep. And the letter was covered in blood and found on her bed. I wonder why she went home. Well, we'll get into that. Okay. But the okay. letter was found on the bed, and it had to be typed in order to be read in court because of all the blood on it. Oh. And uh, I don't know if his handwriting played a part as well, but here's one of the pictures wow. of the letters. Okay. Mm. Now, I'm not sure of the sequence of events 100%, uh, so I'm going to you know do my best. But it sounds like things were fairly normal at first. But then once they married, Gray exhibited, or Green exhibited some type of behavior that made her regret marrying him. JT, the oldest son uh, and the child that I was telling you about that said he took immediate dominance. Right. He would use fear, and he abused them physically and mentally. Oh. So JT said their house went from being like a positive, loving environment, uh, lots of joy, to fear-based really, really quick. Oh. So he just came in and ruined everything. And so, you know, again, not long after, she wanted to separate and then annul the marriage. Uh, Some accounts suggest that in between those times, she allowed Gary back into the house. And then she regretted, you know, doing that. But eventually, she put her phone down. And she was like, I want out of this. And I want you out. And she wanted to go ahead and annul it. Now, the day of the murder. So in spite of all this. Okay, so in spite of seeing that he's abusive, in spite of the boys not being happy, the day of the murder, he persuaded Lavetta. I'm afraid it's Lavita, and I'm saying it wrong, and I feel like I'm disrespecting her. Um, But anyway, he she let him spend the day at the house. Now, Mm. this is important. People need to know how persuasive and manipulative these abusers are. Right, and plus she was a Christian, right, Mm -hmm. and a, a pretty you know, devout. Mm-hmm. So maybe she had sympathy for him or who knows what he used. He They're could have said, I want so you to pray. I want to see. They though. are. They and they're relentless and they'll mm-hmm. tell you what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm afraid that may be what happened. And so people need to understand that, that abusers, number one, don't switch overnight. No. Number two, if they're trying to persuade you or manipulate you to let them back in or, you know, whatever, go out to, you know, dinner with them or go to a bar with them, just say no and try to be careful and get your plan like we've discussed in episode three. Especially a letter that says five people are going to die today. Well, I don't know if she had that yet. I don't know where the letter came in. Regardless of that, though, even... When you have a letter like that, you know, in a normal person's mind, you just don't think that's possible. It's just a threat, scare tactic. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I don't. If you're I not like that, I would take it very serious. Mm-hmm. But like that, you know, drug, I mean, just sit, that, because it's so out of the realm of possibility that you would think someone would do that. Yeah. 
But yeah, they will. They will. And she actually had evidence that he would, which we'll get into. Oh. Okay. So when before he attacked her, I don't know if they had gotten into an argument. I'm assuming they did, but he might have just methodically and coldly started killing mm-hmm. her. I don't know for sure what was happening before the attack, but it was so violent, the knife that he used to stab her um, broke off. And so he went and got another knife. Oh, my God. He, uh, she was stabbed 30 times. The medical examiner also testified that her body showed signs of asphyxia with a bruise on the side of her neck that could have been made by fingers. Uh, she had petechiae in her eye surfaces and a hemorrhage around the cartilage in her larynx. So he was obviously trying to strangle her to death. Mm. And um, it didn't work. And so he decided to stab her. The cause of death was the stab wounds as a whole because not any individual wound would have killed her. So it was all of them together. Oh, that's and she horrible. Probably bled out. And she was found in her bedroom. So this is the bathroom. And before he went after her, he tied up little Jasmine. Um, and Jasmine was like, You better stop, boy. Like she was sassy. Oh. She's like, Stop, boy. And, um, and Lavetta was trying to save her daughter's life. So she grabbed, that's why you see the toilet uh, lid broken. Right. She grabbed the toilet lid and uh, tank lid and tried to hit him with it. And um, she also managed to get her own knife and she stabbed him in the shoulder. But his wounds were superficial. So she, she fought like uh, a strong woman and she fought like a daughter. mother that was trying to oh, save her that's kids. That's terrible. And, uh, but anyway, um, Jasmine witnessed her mother's violent death. Oh, he's a big guy too. Mm -hmm. He's real big. So she was, uh, like the bed was, you know, right here. Her head was at like the side of the bed. And then she was, um, laying, it almost looked like she was laying on her side, right? Like when you would walk into the bedroom door, you would see her immediately. And then the bathroom was off to the left. And, uh, so anyway, after, um, you know, or he said that later when he was caught, he said that he backed up from her when she stabbed him, but it wasn't enough to get him to quit. Wow. Okay, so then he um, gets done killing her, and after that he killed Lavetta, or after he killed uh, her, he grabbed Jasmine, um, filled the bathtub with water, and drowned her. Oh. The medical examiner testified that Jasmine's ankles and wrists were bound with duct tape and there was adhesive residue on her left uh, cheek implying that he taped her mouth shut as well. There was a hemorrhage to the top of her skull and she also had petechiae in the eyelids overlying the thymus in the lower neck as well, the lining of the lungs and the epiglottis. There were also small scrapes and tears on her lower left uh, lip And then there was a small hemorrhage of deep muscle on the right side of her neck and on the back of the left shoulder muscles. Her lungs showed signs of pulmonary edema from a lack of oxygen, and she also had a pink frothy substance around her nose and mouth suggesting that she was brown or drowned. And then a telephone cord had been wrapped around her ankles and tied in a knot. Do you think she was strangled too? I'm wondering if he tried to strangle her. Um, her death was definitely asphyxiation um, and, you know, just the drowning. So she, she drowned, uh, but it wasn't instantaneous. So she oh, suffered. Horrific. And he later told the cops it was so bad that he had to look away. Oh, jerk. Yeah. But it gets weirder. So and he had two I've already counted where he could have stopped. Oh, absolutely. Going to get another knife. Absolutely. I mean, looking away. Oh, oh yeah. Are you no, kidding he, me? He was determined to kill her. He was going to kill her, and he was going to kill uh, the entire family. But the detective that was talking about the case was in tears um, because, you know, it's bad enough the mom, you know, was killed. But he said what the little girl saw, but and knowing, like, she was helpless to save her mom. She was helpless to stop the situation, and she knew she was next. Yeah, but the thing is, why they kill the children? Because usually they kill the children so the mom will suffer. But he killed the mother first, Mm -hmm. 
And he knew he was going to get caught and he was going to kill himself, so why not let the children go? They don't think that way, though. They don't right. have any mercy. They well, don't have yeah, any conscience. True. They're yeah. going to they're gonna destroy the person and anybody tied to that person Aww. in the moment. So hers was a brutal uh, death, uh, a painful death. She suffered a lot before, and she suffered during. Oh. And they found her body outside of the tub. Oh. Um, yeah. And, uh, Why do you take her outside the tub, I wonder? Know. Don't know. And at first they couldn't figure out what happened to her because she didn't have any signs of trauma yet. You know, a lot of the signs will show up later. Right. And, uh, but in spite mm-hmm. of how bad what he's already done was, he's not done. Oh. So he took a shower in the same bathroom that, according to police, police was a bloody mess. Oh, my Lord. He got dressed, picked up the two boys, 9 and 12, from church. And I'd like to read from Jerome, the oldest, his testimony from a habeas corpus petition that the poop bird uh, filed regarding his sentence. So he said, in addition to viewing petitioner's videotape confession, the jury heard the testimony of Jarrett and Jerome Armstead. Jerome, who again is the oldest brother, testified that on the evening of the murders, petitioner entered the church dressed in a black dress shirt, black slacks, and black dress shoes and waited for them. Petitioner, or Green, told them their mother was out clubbing with her friend and that their sister was staying with their grandmother. Jerome noticed nothing unusual about his behavior. When they arrived at home, Green informed them that he had spoken with their mother and she did not want to take them to their grandmother's home. Green told Jerome to take a shower or bath, and Jerome went to take a bath, and Jarrett went to their bedroom. While in the bathtub, Jerome heard Jarrett screaming, Help! He's trying to kill me. Jerome got out of the tub, grabbed his clothes, Green entered the bathroom holding the screaming Jarrett by the collar. Jerome jumped back into the tub. Petitioner threw Jarrett on the toilet and said, Give me some reasons why I shouldn't kill y'all. Oh, my God. So Jarrett, the youngest, said, We're too young to die. Green then stabbed him and told him to shut up. He then tried to stab Jerome but missed. Green then said, Come on, I got to show y'all something. Holding a knife to Jarrett's neck, Green said he would not kill them and led them to their mother's room, where he unlocked the mother's bedroom door and opened it. Oh, my gosh. When they saw their mother lying on the floor not breathing, both boys fell to their knees crying. The boys glanced in the bathroom and saw their sister's body lying against the tub with her hands duct taped behind her back and blood all over the bathroom. Their sister did not appear to be breathing. Green told Jarrett to get him some clothes and instructed Jerome to get some pills on the dresser. Green threw their mother's cell phone on the bed and told them to call the police once he left. When Jerome attempted to dial the phone, Green ordered him to wait until he left. Green said that he killed their mother and sister, that he loved their mother to death. Oh, my God. Green made both boys give him a hug before he left. Just before he drove away, Green said he was going to kill himself. Too bad he didn't. Right. The boys ran next door to alert the neighbor, and Jarrett Armstead's trial testimony largely mirrored that of his older brother. His cruelty is keeping them alive to see those images mm-hmm. when he could have just killed them. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, well, I think that I would have preferred that than those images the rest of my life. Yeah, and I think it was... Uh, the older one, Jerome, that I watched in an interview, I believe it was Evil Lives Here. And um, uh, what was interesting is he said something broke in me. Like when he saw his mom, you know, he says very unreal and and he was crying. And then when he saw his sister, he said something just broke, broke. inside. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, it was the youngest kiddo, Jarrett that was able to convince Green not to kill them. So that's why he kept them alive, because he was going to show them what he'd done and then kill them as well. And that, that's did, the one that was stabbed. How did he do that? He just said, we're too little to die. Oh, and those words are, are what stopped him? They don't him? know what happened. It's like he was you know, basically like a deflated balloon. The, the rage subsided enough to where he decided not to kill them. And, and he promised him they wouldn't tell anybody. If he let them live, that they wouldn't tell anybody. And they also said they loved them. Oh. Mm-hmm. So Jerome, the older brother, said that he was too scared to talk. And uh, and that Jarrett saved them. Because he, he was just traumatized wow. beyond belief. But Green wasn't done. You know, of course, 
um, he said, when he took them into the bathroom or the bedroom to show them their mom, he said, I killed your mom, you know, because I loved her uh, to death. I mean, to me, that... To death. Yeah, that, it's just another punch in the face. You know what I mean? And, I mean, the fact they made them get their pills and stuff. And then, I guess he had this saying... Um, where he said, he, well, he told him, he said, you know how I told you to say, see you later and never buy? Well, this is goodbye. Wow. So I guess there was a saying that, you know, see you later, don't see say you bye, later. you know. And uh, then he drove off in her car. So the boys ran next door to the neighbor, and that was one of the ones in the video that you saw oh, where she's yeah, like in the yeah, long yeah. t-shirt. And she's actually the one that discovered. Too bad it really wasn't buy mm-hmm. for him. Right. And so her name is Latasha Bardfield. And so uh, they went over to her house and little Jarrett was on the phone telling the cops what happened. But she decided to go over to the house, but she had no idea what she was about to get herself into. Okay, so this clip is from Evil Lives Here, Shadow of Death. So let me go ahead and get this started so people can hear some of what happened. Okay. defend us against Gary to the best of her ability but it just kept escalating and I think it was because my mom started to get more and more fearful of him I knew he was aggressive and I knew he was abusive but I never would have labeled him as a murderer gives me goosebumps yeah so i've got it's uh bradfield and i i thought it was levita but the way it's spelled it's levetta so i apologize for that so that's the neighbor i was telling you about right um that discovered the bodies and jt said that um uh you know like he he shut down when he saw everything that was happening and it's obvious from her like i didn't even know I called out her name, you know, so that's just the the trauma that she was in. I think because your brain just doesn't comprehend. No, you don't expect. No, yeah. Who knows what you say? Yeah. yeah or do. You, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's another clip I want to play. Our mom was laying on the floor with blood all around her, all on her dresser, all on her shirt and all on her shoes. And our sister, our little sister, had her arms taped behind her back and there was blood all around the bathroom and there, there was nothing we could do about it. I haven't heard that since the night I said it. Oh, you can tell that's still emotional. Yeah. Oh. So detectives arrive at the scene and one was, now his name's funny, Detective Quirk. Cork? Quirk? Quirk. <laughs> Quirk. Yeah. So, Quirk. So, he said that there was blood everywhere. They saw that Levita had been stabbed, but they didn't see any stab wounds or signs of trauma on Jasmine. But like he said, there, you know, and you saw in the crime scene photos, her body was like facing the tub, like she was lying on her side. Yeah. Right next to it. They also found the letters on the bed that pinned intent ahead of time. And that's how they were able right. to get them on capital murder. Um, and Quirk said that's very unusual. What, the, the letters? That mm-hmm. they'd write letters? Mm-hmm. Well, he thought he was going to kill himself. 
Yeah, but usually they don't write a letter no, saying ahead of time. I mean, they no. may threaten you verbally and things right. like that, but to write an entire letter, which was several pages, you know, um, was interesting. Why would he write a letter? I mean, because no you know if you get caught, that's going to be used against you. Well, and like you said, he was going to commit suicide, right. but he's a coward right. like most abusers yeah, are. And so are. Um, now Green's family literally walked green into the police station the next day really? and kudos for them they oh. the laundry should have done that with their son yeah so they walked him straight to the front desk and in in the interview he said that normally the man is in control but she was always trying to control me of course it's her fault right, right as they always do but the man is in control. Wow. Okay, so you can kind of get an idea of how he thinks. He was very calm, but you know, you could see the anger in the photo when you know oh, they were yeah. together. You could see it in that interview I watched of him on that show, plus in the um, interviews with the cops, even in his mug shots, he looks mad. He, uh, I believe personally that the note that Levita wrote him that she was leaving threw him into a rage and he knew pretty much that she was done that was it was that the first time she told him to leave i don't think so but i think you know they can gauge if it's final like or maybe i'm done maybe he had rage in him all along mm-hmm. you know and the letters oh, he did yeah yeah because he would abuse the kids yeah. and her so even if there wouldn't have been a letter he, he would have killed her i think Oh, Even if she I, yeah. wouldn't have written to him a letter. Oh, yeah. 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 Once he knew she was serious mm -hmm. and she was not going to be with him, I think that's when he decided to kill her and the kids. Oh, so little Jared is brave. He's yeah, a he's brave very little brave. guy. very brave. Both those young men are. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I looked up uh, Green's prior record. Uh, he was convicted in 1989 in Dallas County for possession of cocaine. He got four years probation. He later confessed his probation officer that uh, of selling crack cocaine to see if he could get away with it. He also said that he committed the armed robbery of a grocery store where he had once worked as an act of re revenge for being let go. Oh, wow. It's never his fault, I'm yeah. sure. In 1990, he was sentenced to 20 years for aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. This charge was st for stabbing his high school girlfriend, and robbery. Oh, my God. Yeah. And she had to be hospitalized for a week. Stabbing her. Mm -hmm. So he had a history. He has a history, as well as the fact that he robbed a store for revenge. For he, So he's a very vindictive person. Yeah. But he would have... Anything anyone would have done, even if it was his fault, he would blame. Oh, absolutely. Always. And in that one interview of you know the, the death row mate, inmates, uh, his eyes were cold. They were absolutely cold. There was wow. no compassion. There was no nothing. It was all about him. But there was nothing in him that had any spark of kindness. I wonder or, if he had friends or anything. You know, someone that knew him and might have said something to her or could have. Hey, right. Just, yeah, I and mean, I think that needs to be done. I, do I know people don't want to get involved. Mm -mm. But I had an individual where um, she you know, had an ex-husband that was about to get married to this lady. And they knew each other. And I said, should you warn her? And she said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing. And she actually was brave and did talk with her and explained the things that led to her divorcing him. Did she believe it? She or, did, but she went ahead and made the yeah, choice to yeah. marry. So, but at least the individual that spoke with her made the right decision. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't necessarily, like, he wasn't physically abusive. He was just a, you know, crappy husband. And I think there was some mental abuse mm. now belinda lacy a former corrections officer at tdcj where green was incarcerated testified that he married her just so she would convince parole officials to release him oh my now that tells you his power of persuasion so you've got where he convinces levita to let him in the house mm -hmm. the day of the murder and then he convinces this lady to marry him so that she could get him paroled oh my gosh Okay, so he was very persuasive, very There's manipulative. Nothing in him. There's and, yeah, nothing. And not only that, but a corrections officer should not be duped like that. No. That's why, I mean, personally, I mean, I know I might get hate mail on this, but I don't think that, um, I wish it could be women officers interacting with women mm -hmm. and male officers interacting with males. 
um, because you hear of those stories. Now, it is rare where women fall in love with inmates mm-hmm. because they're so persuasive. Oh, they do, yeah. But anyway, so once he was out, he dumped her. Of course he did. Shalonda Ransom, the mother of two of Green's kids, testified of his propensity to anger easily and that he had choked her to the point of unconsciousness. A former correctional officer testified of when Green threw a food tray at him. His former supervisor from the same store he later robbed said that it was violent uh, with shots fired and he kicked open the office door. So, oh. Yeah, he was pretty brutal in that deal. Do you know about his childhood? We'll get into some of okay, it. Okay, okay. So Jerome and Jarrett had to testify, uh, which we already went over. Right. Um, but Jarrett was seated on the witness stand uh, during a break, and when he saw Green enter the room, he started crying uncontrollably. Oh. And they couldn't get him to calm down. So they had to get him out of the courtroom, and then he returned minutes later uh, with pockets full of candy. Oh, okay. Candy make anyone <laughs> happy, wouldn't it? And so he was able to testify. But it was it was the... Was Green still in there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he can stand before his accusers. Well, that's and true. And little Jarrett's one of but those. But a child, oh, that's true. And he would, like, glance repeatedly at Green, but he was able to do it. Oh. Green would just stare straight ahead. Good for him. What a, what a courageous young man. Well, and then he said that he once cared for Green and told jurors, I loved him to death. Oh, he did? He did. Oh. Wasn't that good? That was very good. <laughs> I'm like, you smart little cookie, you. <laughs> yeah. Loved him to death. Loved him to death. Yeah. Okay. Now, to answer your question for the defense, they um, brought in their own evidence. So this is from the court documents. Green's mother, her name is Mary Sampson. She described Green's childhood in the South, South Oak Click cliff area of dallas as chaotic and marked by multiple bizarre incidents so i've not heard of south oak cliff area yeah it's it's south oak i mean uh yeah it's not a real good area okay i think they used to have i don't know if they still do i mean this year's it wasn't a place to go gangs okay you know it was just hard so it was a hard neighborhood for maybe kiddos to grow up in yeah yeah uh green stayed to himself but just to say, it doesn't matter. Some people could be raised there in bad places. Oh, it doesn't yeah. mean they're going to grow up to be killers. I didn't grow up in some yeah. of the best neighborhoods yeah. myself. So, uh, Okay, so he stayed to himself while growing up. She said his grades in, schools, in school were not good, but she was satisfied with them. Green was age seven when she married Leon Sampson, uh, or Sampson to whom she was, had been married for uh, 31 years. Samson took Petitioner to job sites, but Petitioner was unwilling to help do the remodeling work that Samson did. Green was not good at housework or yard work. In middle school, uh, he once went on the roof of a school building and threatened to jump off, but his aunt talked him down. Wow. From that point on, Green constantly said that he was stressed and that no one understood him. Green would not sit with his back toward a door and kept a baseball bat in his room. Wow. Paranoia, huh? Yep. Mm. And I don't know, like, was he abused by someone that they were unaware of and he was scared, or was he already having mental problems? With the stepfather, did it show any abuse anywhere? Nothing? Uh, He felt as if people were talking about him. Paranoid. Yep. And Green once claimed that someone had broken into the house while he was in the shower. He dropped out of school in the 11th grade, and his daughter, who was seven at the time of the trial, was constantly in trouble at school and um, played by herself as well. Oh, so no. that Now, that's the original court record. So they're trying to establish that there might be some mental illness going on here in the family. Mm. Mrs. Sampson testified she was shocked when Green was put on probation for dealing drugs and then assaulting his girlfriend. He became even more withdrawn after he left the uh, penitentiary the first time. He was later arrested for robbing a grocery store. Green married Belinda Lacey when he got out of prison, but they remained together less than a year. He chain-smoked and often said he was stressed. Green was involved in at least three romantic relationships after prison, including with Linnell Williams, LaVita, and Shalonda, the mother of of two of his children. Did any of the women say they were abused? Um, I think... Think so, but I'm not to that point yet. Oh, oh okay. I'll, I'll see. Okay, sorry. Um, I, well, I mean, he stabbed the one. 
you well, know. Yeah, yeah. So he was definitely abusive, but I don't know what extent it went to. Mm. And could they bring it out in court? Because the death of, I don't know, I'm not going to pronounce her name. I won't La Vida. La Vida was pretty bad. Oh, yeah. Pretty violent, yeah. pretty... Just it was cruel. crazy it was and cruel. cruel. Mm-hmm. So I just wonder if there had been abuse. Yeah, to other I, I women. would say stabbing his well, yeah. former girlfriend was definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. But you said he dated quite a bit. The, the three. Well, they're just talking about the people. three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, let's see. Okay, he became more withdrawn. He robbed. Um, shortly before the murders, Green called his mother from Timberlawn Mental Hospital to inform her that he had checked himself into that facility because he was at the end of his rope. Hmm. He told her he wanted to go to sleep and never wake up. He remained at Timberlawn for five days until LaVita came and picked him up. Oh. She, yeah. She and Green's younger brother spoke on the phone when uh, with Green after the murders, and they later went to the location where he was staying and convinced him to turn himself in. She said that she has seen remorse in Green, who later told her he has seen LaVita sitting at the foot of his bed talking to him. I don't think he has any remorse. I don't either. She Miss, may have wanted to see it. Yeah, and that's but, his, her, her son. Yeah, you know, it's her son, mom. but yeah, I don't think he has any remorse. And especially seeing the post-interviews, that, you know, after he's been convicted. He has no remorse whatsoever. It's all LaVita's fault. Did he get the death penalty? Yeah. Hopefully he's dead by now. I can't remember. We'll see if it's in my notes. Right. Um, Mrs. Sampson explained that her sister was treated for mental problems. One of her brothers killed his wife. Oh, my God. And co- then committed suicide. And her mother sees doctors and takes medication for mental health issues. Mrs. Sampson had a nervous breakdown while pregnant with Green's brother after her brother committed suicide and oh. you know, killed um, his wife. And she's been prescribed Valium. Wow. Mrs. Sampson testified that Carter, the father of both of her sons, was physically abusive, kicking her in the stomach and blacking and blackening her eye when she was pregnant with Green's brother. She left Carter in 78 and 79. Carter once attempted to get Green to fight another child. Uh, Green witnessed Carter being violent toward her. Petitioner was age two when Carter went to Fort, uh, Fort Leavenworth Penitentiary when he, where he died. Carter was out of the house by the time the, uh, Green's brother was born. Mental illness all the way around. Parents, and then the parents, parents or relative brothers. And then you see violence. Oh. You know, so you got the violence of your uncle. You've got the violence of your dad. And, uh, you know, Richard Ramirez, the um, yeah. Night Stalker, uh, he saw, was it his cousin kill his wife? Yeah, it was the cousin. And instead of being... Like, he was freaked out about it, mm-hmm. but that was one of the things that shaped his thought processes. Yes, yeah, he stayed with the cousin a lot, and the, the cousin maybe didn't know it, but he was, you know, showing him ways and things to do. To And photos. Yeah, yeah. photos. Like he would, um, was he in Vietnam or something? And he would show him, like, dead bodies. Something, yeah. And so he was exposed mm-hmm. to that. Uh, mm-hmm. I am... I am pretty much on the side that it's both nature versus nurture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, you know, you can have definite situations where you've got something is wrong with someone mm-hmm. and that's the one that you show stuff to like that or they witness a violent it escalates, act and yep. then they end up being uh, killers. It's like shaping them to be a killer or a better to killer. To a degree. To a degree. Because they can still choose to say no. I think he was born evil. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, he might have been. <laughs> well, and they have like you know that show Evil Lives Here. That's yeah, what they do. Yeah, yeah, they go back even to the childhood where the parents were scared of them, and they didn't. You know, they were just there was something wrong, and they would have uh, rage, and they think they have actually found some genes that like murder really? genes. Yeah, but they have discovered that the part of the brain that controls impulse and emotion is underdeveloped or inactive. Really? It's very inactive. So it's in the front area. So like if you get really angry, people have a normal brain, it will get really active to bring it down and you'll start thinking about things in reverse course. But in people like green and others, that doesn't happen. It stays like blue and green. It doesn't activate. Could you imagine though to be... Scared of your own child. 
Well, and to me, that's all the more reason to keep them locked up. That ain't a reason to let them out. Like a lot of people are like, well, it's not their fault. You know, they were born that way. No, society, the job Mm -hmm. of law enforcement Mm -hmm. is to keep us safe. If you don't have the brain capacity to shut down violent emotion and acts, you don't need to be out. You need to be locked up forever. Yeah, and you see some, you know, they're charmers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they get out of jail. They had horrific crimes they committed. And what would make you think that it's not going to happen again? Right. There's no rehabilitation. I mean, you can... Pre- well, there is and in can jail, you but... can rehabilitate yeah, someone can whose you? brain doesn't function normally? Yeah, that it's not a normal brain. Yeah. yeah. Like, how can you do that? So, to me, it doesn't support the argument no. of letting them out. No. It supports the argument of keeping them in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs. Sampson testified Green was arrested for aggravated robbery uh, less than four months after getting out of prison for assaulting his former girlfriend, Jennifer. She did not write uh, State Exhibit 160, which was a letter addressed to the state parole official, officials urging his release uh, that he said was from her. And she believes that doc- that document is in Green's handwriting. So oh. it sounds like he wrote the letter as if from her for them to let him out. Oh. Uh, while she only knows that her sister has been treated for mental health issues, she believes other relatives have been to mental hospitals. She believes her own mother's mental health is normal. During her prior testimony before the grand jury, she testified Petitioner had no mental issues growing up, was not mentally retarded, and had never told her that he had been sexually abused. Mm. So those are the court records. And then the final one is from his grandmother. Well, I think he already he had issues when he was little. I do, too. Mental issues. He was isolated. He thought people were talking about him. Maybe the mother just, you know, sometimes broke in. Yeah. And you notice everything that he did do, it was everybody else's fault, Mm -hmm. not his. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you, I don't know, I would see things, I would think. As a mother, wouldn't you? I mean. Well, I would think that would be normal. Mental illness or so. But it depends on the situation. Is a home already chaotic so you don't have time to pursue what Uh, you think you're seeing? Do you dismiss what you're seeing as the fact that the home is chaotic? Yeah, that's true. So I'm not sure that they would, you know. See anything because that's normal to them. Yeah. If it's. But if you have mental illness in your family, I'm kind of wondering if you think that you know, him thinking someone broke in that didn't or other things might be a little bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so the grandmother, Bertha Curry, uh, also testified extensively regarding his childhood and background. Uh, She also said that their dad beat both Green and his mother, quote, all the time. He was a violent person who kicked Green's mother while she was pregnant with um, his younger brother. Uh, Green was real young when Carter was out of the picture, though. As a child, Green once grabbed and bit off the head of a snake. Oh. But when she attempted to tell Green's mother about the incident, she didn't want to hear about it and insisted nothing was wrong with Green. She knows something was yeah, wrong. Yeah, so with, that now answers uh, the question you had, because yeah. I didn't know that was in the notes, that the mother was ignoring clear red All flags. The flags, mm-hmm. yep. Miss, uh, Mrs. Curry had been taking anxiety medication and antidepressants for many years. One of her daughters, a sister of Green's mother, was sent to a psychiatric hospital, and then it was her stepson that killed his wife and himself. Wow. Petitioner was never a normal child. From an early age, Green said that he did not want to live because the devil was after him. As a child, Green often cried and did not want to be with friends because he was afraid they would make fun of him. He reached the ninth or 10th grade in school, had a lot of friends growing up, but preferred to play by himself. After Green got out of prison the first time, he was never happy and often talked of suicide. He had jobs at a grocery store and a warehouse when he got out of prison, but never held those jobs more than a year. Mm. Petitioner began withdrawing from her around 2007, 2008, and seemed nervous and unfocused on normal things. She last saw Green, now this is a grandmother still, uh, in December 2008, when he was with LaVita and her three children, Petitioner was capable of being kind and had relationships with Jennifer, Shalonda, and Belinda. Mrs. Curry believes Green's uh, crimes do not reflect his true personality. Oh, she doesn't. Mm-mm. What? How could she not? That is his whole personality. 
I don't get that at all. Wow. Yep. Making excuses for him, maybe? I think people get duped when they see people that are as jacked, nice, and kind. Yeah, but he was messed up his whole life. Yeah, but they... So, like... And again, that's why I was telling you last night. Remember that one that put the axe in the back of the head of his mother? Oh, yeah. Even in prison, his face with tats, his neck with tats, um, he was very personable. Yeah. He was immediately likable. Mm -hmm. And everybody liked him when he was a kid. And so that was one of the signs I was telling you that I felt he was a psychopath. In fact, uh, I think I told this story maybe in the first season, but when I was um, a president of a certain organization for a year, I chose this guy as my VP because he was super funny and likable right off the start. But I immediately began to wonder if he was a psychopath because he was so charming, so likable. And that mm-hmm. to me is a clue. Right. And uh, so I'm kind of studying them, you know, for the nine months we were part of this organization. Well, anyway, I was talking about, I think it was 2016 and all those fires that broke out in California, yeah. just everywhere. His sister lived out there with his nephew. And um, anyway, we were talking and and about the fires. And so he came to sit with us on the bus because we're going to the next event. And he said, yeah, my sister lives out there. She had to um, run out of the apartment and her hair was uh, on fire because she she waited so long. And I said, oh, my goodness, is she okay? He goes, yeah. And he just had this like real nonchalant like he was telling me the weather attitude. And so I'm looking at him and the other people are kind of looking at him. And I said, well, I'm glad she's safe. Yeah. Yeah. She's a leech on society. I mean, I don't. Oh, wow. <laughs> so anyway, it comes out sooner or later. Later. Um, now, again, there's functional psychopaths and dysfunctional mm-hmm. psychopaths. And he's in the military and he, you know, he's a good kid. But um, later I was telling him about psychopathy and that you know just because you hear someone say psychopathy doesn't mean that they're like ted bundy they just don't have a lot of empathy and so they can function in specific areas like surgeons don't need a lot you can't have them crying while they're doing brain surgery you know um clergy actually was in the top five um, i saw sales too sales which which done you my whole in. life <laughs> um politician etc so on the bus i was talking about you know psychopathy and he, his ears perk up, and he says, do you think I'm a psychopath? And I said, yes. What an interesting question. I said, yes, I do. I think you're a psychopath. And he like, gets this look on his face like, this is terrible. And I said, well, there's a way you can test. And so there is a, a psychopathy scale of one to five, and you answer several questions. And I said, take it and tell me what you are. Because I had already taken it, and I was like a 3.5. And uh, so he takes it. He was a 4.5. Oh. Yeah. And, What'd he say? Uh, he he was scared at first, like he was going to be a killer or something. I'm like, no. There's pl- there's lots of people out there that have low empathy, you know, all of that, and they're not killers and they're not even bad people or abusers. And they often wonder what's wrong with them because they don't feel what other people feel. And we were talking about that th- the other night. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. me, I don't feel what other people feel. Yeah, but I'm the not only a time. A lot of people do with psychopathy is if they've been through it, then they can connect that to someone else's situation. But other than that, it's like the lights are off, yeah. you know. So in uh, all that to say that I think Green was probably a psychopath from the start. Mm-hmm. And then I think he also had mental illness as well as um, anger that turned into rage so that by the time he was with Levita, it's over. She didn't have a chance. And he had mental illness all in the family. Yes. Way back. Including violent. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Dr. Martinez testified that Green had borderline personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder. We could tell that a minute ago. Yep. Avoidant personality disorder, depressive personality, and then the antisocial personality disorder is another phrase for uh, psychopathy, but it takes it more to the dangerous side. You know, and then, of course, a lot of abusers have antisocial um, personality disorder, and then some of them end up killing. He also said that Green had reported episodes of severe depression, sadness, affective insanity, uh, anxiety, agitation, and uh, paranoid delusions. He also said that his IQ was only 78, but prison records show it was 105. 
I don't believe he felt anything. Sympathy. Oh, no. No. So the prosecutor, they cross-examined Dr. Martinez. On cross-examination, Dr. Martinez admitted Green was not diagnosed with a mental illness during either of his incarcerations or while in custody prior to trial, but expressed the opinion that the quality of mental health care Green received while in custody was poor. He admitted Green's chronic abuse of marijuana could lead to a a depressed affect or the opposite, and that Green was not diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder at Timberlawn. Remember, he was there for five days. But he was only there five days. I know. I mean... Yeah. But he probably didn't have insurance. Yeah. Dr. Martinez did point out that Petitioner was placed under close observation while at Timberlawn due to suicidal ideation, but admitted Green apparently had little trouble sleeping while there and checked himself out of that facility. Dr. Martinez admitted that while awaiting trial for capital murder, Green was diagnosed with adjustment disorder and requested an issue of Psychology Today magazine. That's interesting. Too bad all the times that he wanted to kill himself, he just never did. (laughs) Wow. That's a way to sum it up. Yeah. So I think he's playing the game. Yeah, I do think he has problems, but I don't think that that should be any defense whatsoever and that he should not, again, be let out if he's that jacked in the head. He he has mental problems, but you can't use that as an excuse to kill, but you know what you're doing. Mm. And all they're trying to do. Especially the kids. Because he's going to jail. Yeah. All they're trying to do is make the jury feel sympathy for him and have a reason not to put him to death. But they didn't. No, they and gave they him capital the murder. Um, so he gets to Psychology Today magazine, which I'm sure he's reading the articles in there on how to seem even more crazy. Mm-hmm. Dr. Martinez stated that the uh, petitioner reported that he set fire to a dog while he was a child. So there's that That's one. That's the first sign there. Yep. Animals engaged in conduct before age 15, which qualified him for a diagnosis of conduct disorder, and that Green meets any many of the criteria for antisocial disorder. Dr. Martinez did not discuss Green's capital offense with him, did not review the video recording of petitioner's confession, and could not express any opinion regarding whether petitioner's capital offense was related related to schizoaffective disorder. Dr. Martinez explained the term comorbidity. Which that is, means a person can have both a mental illness and a personality disorder. So the personality disorders are simply a series of traits people have, like narcissism, psychopathy, um, things like that. Okay, borderline personality. All that means is that's who they are. Yeah. That's why it's so dumb to think that you can change someone with that disorder. Mm-mm. Because once they're in it, that's literally their makeup. Uh, the mental illness is apart from that. That's where you have, you know, the schizophrenic, the, um, you know, maybe the depressed states, anxiety, things like that. So they're saying that he had both. His personality was jacked, but they um, also are trying to say that he had mental illness. But this guy's like, you know, he's probably got both, but I don't know if it'd be enough for him to do what he did. But yet, men and women always think they can change somebody, mm-hmm. even when there's signs, yeah. flags everywhere. Like we've been seeing in these yeah. cases. Mm-hmm. So you have where he has the mental and emotional breakdown, he said, when he went to Timberlawn. Uh, Dr. Martinez also reported that when he was in prison, he was treated for depression and a nervous breakdown, and he was dubious of his score of 105 IQ that was reported in his prison records. He doesn't think that's real. Well, if you've ever taken those IQ tests, they're not easy. No. So I don't know how he could fake actually being smarter than he was. It's uh, sad she didn't know any of his background. Right. Which, you just think one of his relatives, a friend, someone. People don't want to get involved. They don't want to get involved. Or she could have been warned and maybe. You didn't know, pay but attention. I think she was the type of person that if she was warned, she I think she would have said something. Yeah. Um, let's see. And to finish up his testimony, he testified that petitioner's action in driving his girlfriend, Jennifer, to the hospital after assaulting her. So he stabs her. Then he drives her to the hospital was inconsistent with both, both a lack of remorse and a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. He also stated that persons with antisocial personality disorder can be outgoing and even charming. Of course they can. But so he's like, Wait a minute, you know, if he, he, there's no way he couldn't feel bad for what he did uh, if he was that wicked. Like if he, 
he felt bad for stabbing her, so he drives her to the hospital. I don't know. Oh, no. I'm wondering if it was self-preservation to get her there so she didn't die. Yeah, so she didn't die and he wouldn't get in trouble. Right. I don't think he feels anything. I don't Or anybody. Either. I wonder how the boys are. Well, I'm, we're going to finish up with them. Okay. I. Yeah. Um, Could you imagine seeing all that and having to live your life? Okay. It's horrible. So, so I think it was here. So this is one of the videos the um, jury saw. Okay, so technical difficulties. Here we Again. go. Yep. I can sing America. Nobody dares says to us eat in the kitchen. Besides, they'll see how beautiful we are and be ashamed. We too are America. That's horrible. So they That's played so that sad. in uh, court, and that was the clip that Jasmine, um, that they saw of Jasmine, and it, everybody was crying, except for oh, Green, yeah. of course. Um, and, I mean, she was just such a neat little girl that, you know, everybody was emotional with it. So after all the testimony, both sides, the jury found him guilty of capital murder. They sentenced him to death, and he remains on death row at the Allen B. Polunsky unit in Liv Livingston, Texas. Oh. And I think I've got some pictures of him. So this is him in jail. He still looks Look angry. Look how angry he looks. So he looks so angry. angry. He looked when angry he, when he in the picture when he met her. Yeah. So he right looks there. angry he there. He just looks angry. This is how he looked in that um, show I watched of him. That was him uh, when they uh, interviewed him. What was the show? I think it was The Mind of a Murderer. Oh, not Evil Lives Here. Mm-mm. And then this is Jerome, the, the oldest. oldest, and this is Jarrett, the one that talked him out of killing them. You know, he he can't feel anything. You take your the two young boys to see the body of your mother, your sister, gruesome, mm -hmm. and then the, he can't feel anything. Well, and JT, you know, said that he never saw this coming. Like you heard in that mm -hmm. one clip, he said, I knew he was bad i didn't ever think he was a killer and well, who does think that and he said you know he was aggressive he was abusive but you just don't connect the no. dots there levita never told latasha the neighbor that there was abuse in the home but latasha suspected it from hearing the yelling and seeing some of what was going on uh, jt told about a time that his mom came home and she had a cast on her leg and she wouldn't say what happened. And he thinks mm. it's because Green broke her broke leg. Broke her leg. And Latasha said that she's still mad at herself. So this is her where the producer asked, you know, if you're mad at yourself. So we'll finish with this and any closing thoughts. I am. I know what the abuse looks like. And I know how you hide the abuse. You tell everyone that there's nothing going on. I just knew how I was looking inside of Levita's house. I knew there was abuse going on there, but I would not call 911. I didn't call social services. I didn't go to the school and say, hey, can y'all step in? Do y'all see anything? No, it's like I played a part in the cover-up because I didn't want to see the family torn apart to me, it makes me feel like I failed them. I told both of them I was sorry. Because knowing what I know, seeing what I saw, in my mind, I'm saying I'm putting them first by keeping them together when in actuality, I did them the most harm by not saying anything. A lot of people don't say anything, though, because they don't want to get involved. And, when, and they don't think it'll escalate to a murder. And when she said that, that she didn't want to tear a family mm -hmm. apart, I heard that as a kid. Because there were, you know, like in a lot of the neighborhoods we lived in, you know, they weren't, you know, the best. Uh, some were really good, but it just depended. And you would, like, know that there was abuse going on. Or you would hear, you know, people discussing knowing abuse was going on mm -hmm. in a family, but they didn't want to tear apart the family. 
Mm-hmm. And when she said that, I think that epitomizes some of what people feel and what explosion it will call if you turn that in. Mm-hmm. But you need to report. And if the person that you report, you know, that family unit, um, unfortunately, we found case mm-hmm. after case of Child Protective Services that don't actually do anything they with don't. the family. Mm-mm. But at least you know you did something. But also, I think the other side of it is you've got to know that if you get involved, you just might need safety measures in your own life mm-hmm. just as much as the people that you abused. And so it's count the cost and know that you might be a target. And that's what we had to do when we were trying to help that lady get away. Uh, and sure enough, he threatened me. Uh, mm-hmm. He uh, slit the tires of another girl that was helping her. He burned their house down. And she still went back with them. But she still went back. I feel that the only reason he didn't mess with me is because he was scared of Mike. And Mike went over and told him, you better cut this stuff out. And he did. But um, anyway, so there's, it, to me, there's a cost. And it comes, and I wouldn't fault anyone for being afraid that if they get involved, they might become a target. But personally, I can't sit around and watch someone get abused. And I was willing to take that risk. You know, people, I think, too, are, are more apt to do it now. Because in the 70s, 60s, 80s, nobody wanted to get involved. Mm -hmm. And now it's open. It's right in the front. Yep. And people, more people, are getting involved than they used to. And I hope it continues. And mental abuse even is just as bad sometimes. It is. As physical abuse. And know that, you know, your brain, its only job is to keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And so it will throw up excuse after excuse after excuse for why you shouldn't get involved or why you shouldn't get out. Mm -hmm. All of those things, because your brain hates change. And it's like, no, 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 we don't need to rock the boat, but you need to rock the boat. And organizations need to be changed. Um, Child services, for instance, a lot of children have died because they're overworked. I've heard that a zillion times. Hire more people. Yeah. And, oh, well, they didn't seem unhappy or abused when I was there. Yeah. I mean, a lot has to be done. Well, Still a lot of work. And I, and I think, you know, one thing that I would want to say as well is that the thing is, is that um, it needs to be hard to take someone's kids away. It does. It needs to be hard. But do a little bit of digging, if at all possible. But you're right. They're so overloaded and so overworked. It may seem impossible at times and more training Mm -hmm. to spot it it's just you know even the intelligent women that we've we've talked about mm -hmm. have been fooled Mm -hmm. by abuse well like that kid that kid that had um that he was abusive and they the mother locked him in the room and remember they thought that he was uh being abused what did i say when he covered his eyes, I instantly knew he was lying. Oh, yeah. Why don't these people know that? They should be trained in those things. You know, when you were talking about how charming that guy was last night on the show we watched, I actually found myself feeling sorry for him. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then I thought, oh, no, 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 no. No, he because put it's an, all axe an axe in the back of his yeah. mother's yeah. head. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And calmly. You know, I didn't believe he did it at first when we were watching because he was so... Personable. Yeah, he's personable. Intelligent. And he seemed honest mm-hmm. and... Mm-hmm. All along. And mm-hmm. then the complete change when he comes out of <clears throat> interviewed in the prison. Covered in Tattoos tats. everywhere. Mm-hmm. And he, and like you said, I didn't notice he had that tear on his mm-hmm. tattoo. Which meant he killed. Because he killed his mother. Mm-hmm. And he was a gangbanger. You could tell by his yeah, language. you could tell. It doesn't take a lot to educate yourself. No. Mm-hmm. Speaking of education, do you remember our saying? Yes. But do you want to tell him you have on your site... For abuse again. Well, we've told them three times in this episode. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You did? Well, you've mentioned it twice, and I've mentioned it. But yes, there's resources for people. Military. Outlineofamurder.com mm-hmm. or outlineofamurderpodcast.com. I do know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Be safe. Hang on. Hang on. Be strong. No. Mine is... No, no, Okay. No. Be... 
smart. Smart. It is smart. It was it's on the tip of my tongue. It's always been smart for three years. It's on the tip of my tongue. What's yours? Be rude. And don't be a victim. You're fired. I remember the You're rude fired. part because, you know, I can fired. be rude. Outline of a Murder is a Mr. Joseph production. What do you think, Joseph? Ah!